if all you want to be able to do is just answer questions, then you can check out now. You can start off on your exercise if you like. But I'm going to dig a little bit deeper. Now to help me understand this, what you need is um, three pens. Three pens. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do them here. And we're just using these pens to give us a bit of a model for what this thing looks like. Actually, I don't think I need this. Put away. Success, okay, wonderful. Um, you're gonna need some pens, um, and you also need something, you, you still need to keep drawing, okay? so. Um, um, sorry that, that you're going to have to sacrifice some of your pens. Make sure you've got at least one. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this simplified model for a second. And there's a big glaring problem with that simplified model. And in fact, it's kind of the, the way we've simplified it, you know, the, the, the joke about the physicist and the spherical count. The way that we've simplified it allows us to solve the question. But unfortunately, I feel, and you can judge for yourself when we get to the end of the explanation, I feel this, the way we simplified it, the specific way we simplified it, actually sort of pulls the rug out from underneath why not just the cyclist can incline, so they can do it, but in fact the cyclist must incline, otherwise they can't successfully make the turn. Okay. What was the simplification I started off with to actually make this model work? The cyclist is a point. Okay, and I had to do that because that's the only tools that I have to deal with at the moment. Okay? And I said to you, I, I alluded to the fact that when you don't consider a point, the for even just on one dimension, the forces get super, super crazy, okay? So I want you to imagine this guy here, right, as an object, and it has, it has a, a length, okay? I won't even worry about two dimensions at the moment. Because this object has a length, now, as with real estate, when you consider the forces, it's all about location, 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 right? So I want you to, I asked you for three pens, right? So I've got this one in the middle, which represents an object. Um, then I've got two other ones that represent forces, okay? Now, if what I do is I have these forces sort of opposing each other, same length, you might have to draw something like this if you like, opposing each other, same length, and they're at the same point, okay? Tell me, what is the net force on this object? Zero. Net force is zero. Great, everything is balanced out, okay? Um, I, can, I can move them about, that's okay, that's fine. If I've got a single point and it's just there, obviously, still net force zero, okay? But if I change the locations of these forces, okay? Like this. What is the net force? Hmm. Now, the net, here's where I need to add a new concept, so I'm going to distinguish. So far we just say net force and we're like, well that's the only kind of force there is, right? I'm going to say there's a net linear force here. There's a net linear force. This is still headed up, this is still headed down, the directions have not changed, and their, quant their magnitudes haven't changed. So if I just add it up linear, linear-wise, I'll still get zero, okay? But, the net torque, new word. The turning moment of a force. Yes. The net torque is not zero because, of course, right? What does this mean? What does this mean? Um, if I start to, and you've got this on your on your page, and I insist that you actually physically do this with me, right? As you push, what happens? It turns, right? It must turn. So torque means a force that imparts not linear velocity but angular velocity. Okay? So torque is the special name we give to something which is going to, to tend something towards rotation, okay? Now, understanding the cyclist's torque is everything. That's what this whole situation is about, okay? Because it is in fact the, the fact that, like I, I picked this out, not accidentally, it's because the cyclist has height, right? That is what makes this actually complicated, right? Which is why as well, if you see, um, if you see trucks, like semi-trailers, and um, they will sometimes have this, you know, this diagram on the back, like this. And what they're indicating is, because some semi-trailers are really, really tall, they are so tall that torque forces are actually influencing and can make these things tip over, right? It's the height. It's the height that really matters, right? So considering this is just a point, kind of takes the heart and soul out of what makes the mechanics work, okay? So I just want to quickly show you these, and these might be kind of like the diagrams you've, you might want to have. Uh, oh, I unplugged this, that's right. Back in 
Okay? So these are the cases that I just went through. So it's important to have some diagrams that look like this, right? If you've got opposite and equal forces on a point, no dramas. If you've got opposite equal forces on the same point in an object, still no problem. But if you move them to other positions, that's when you add angular momentum, okay? There's one other thing you need to worry about, which um, I could draw it up, but I'm just going to show you this. Okay. Um, uh, two things, actually. Um, where, where you put things is important, right? So the further you are away, if there's like some fixed point which must rotate, okay? For instance, you know, the hands of a clock, okay? There's a point that stays put and the rest of it can move, okay? The further you are away from that point, that fixed point of rotation, the more torque is, is actually put in. And that makes sense. If you think about, this is the way that, um, this is the way that levers and um, like spanners and that kind of thing work. It's like, look, if I'm over here, I don't have to apply much force at all if I have a really, really long spanner to make something turn. If I've got something short, like one of those awkward allen keys and you have to hold it the wrong way, you can put heaps of force in it. It hurts your fingers and all that kind of thing. Okay? So, this is the way that torque sort of is proportional. Um, there's one more important thing that's worth writing down, which is this guy over here. If you've got some fixed point, let's call it O, because everything is going to be rotating around that, right? If you have a force that is at O, that's at O, or it's directed toward O, then they don't exert any torque. Just think about that for a second, right? For example, have a look at, my, um, at the turning hands of the clock, okay? If you exert a force at the end of the hand, of course it will spin around, that's fine. But if you exert a force at the center of the clock, it's not going to spin. Nothing will happen, no matter which way you point it, okay? And in the same way, in fact, I'm just going to pull it down because I need to be able to, whoopsie. There we go. Okay, so I've said, if, if I push here, if I push here, it's not going to rotate, right? In the same way, if I push this way or I push this way, of course there's rotation. But if I push along the hand of the clock, right? So I'm pushing here. I'm pushing at a point that's not the center. But if I direct my force toward the center, like that, up the axis of the hand, what rotation is going to happen? None. Answer, none. So that's why they don't exert any torque. And that's actually really a really important point, okay? Uh, I've tried to boil it down as simply as I can. Forces at or directed toward the center of rotation, they exert no torque. Okay. That's all the pieces that we need. Now we're ready to consider this cyclist.